Hi guys and welcome to Health for Niger platform. I'm so excited because we're going to do a two for one here. We're going to record a YouTube video and we're going to also record a podcast. I have a special guest with me here today. Her name is Dr. Simonia and she is an incredible physician with tons and tons of accomplishments. And I'm so happy to have her here on Health for Niger. Health for Niger is a health education platform and we are not giving any medical advice. We're just talking generally. Our audience is global. So join me in welcoming Dr. Simonia to the show. Hi, Ngozi. Hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Noha. I'm so happy to be here. Welcome. So happy to have you. I've been following your work now for the past year and I've seen some amazing writings. So tell me, how did you get into creativity? You're a physician, you have a lot of training, you have a lot of credentials to your name. You also play music, you write, and you have a book out. So before we launch into the reason for this podcast, which is music and medicine, uh, based off of an article I saw in Medium, how did you get into this creativity and medicine blend? Well, good question. It's, it's uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> we probably have 20 minutes. It, it's not the easiest question to answer because I, for me, I think that um, I, I, the creativity, I guess, was, was there all along. I just didn't recognize it. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I mean, growing up, I thought an artist was somebody who could draw and I couldn't draw. I didn't think of myself as an artist, you know. I liked music, you know, but I only had piano lessons for a very brief period. But, um, but deep down inside me, I always, I always, uh, I continued to nurture the interest in music. You know, I would play and practice on my own, started picking up, uh, other instruments um, later in life. And um, when I was done with all that medical training, I, I just, I realized that I still couldn't get away from, you know, wanting to play the piano, wanting to sing, wanting to write, uh, uh, wanting to do photography. You won't believe it. I didn't, uh, I didn't um, own my own, my own camera, my first camera till I was um, over 30. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but then, you know, I developed this passion. I saw that I had this passion for photography, you know, and I yeah. was able to combine my interest in uh, photography and writing um, and, and publish, uh, I was able to publish two photo books. So it's been an interesting journey. I, um, I'm i still trying to figure out what the best way, <laughs> the best way forward in terms of, uh, you know, bringing all my interests together, but I, I think I'm gradually getting there. And uh, the article was really about um, teaching and learning and music and medicine. You know, I like to reflect, I'm in medical education. So yeah. I like to reflect about learning. And I, sometimes I think about things uh, in music, you know, and concepts in learning music. And I, I think about, you know, I, I compare, you know, learning in music and learning in medicine. And that's, those are some of the things I wrote about in the, um, in the article. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what you do is, for me, I'm an ideas person. So I like to dream. And I think what you've done is very nicely just moved ahead with your interests. You know, a lot of people have, a lot of doctors or healthcare professionals have interests outside medicine, but sometimes they don't know how to take that first step, you see, and often they just want to follow the crowd. And I think what you've done is really courageous, being able to step out of that mold yeah. <laughs> that we have as physicians, that oh, we must follow this path. And mm -hmm. you've explored sort of the creative outlets the creative outlets and I, I think that's really good so mm -hmm. let's let's dive into this article this article uh, was published uh, in medium and it's titled uh -huh. teaching and learning in music and medicine so when mm -hmm. I read through it I really like the fact that you you mentioned there should be some kind of evolution in medical education where 
mm -hmm. basic sciences should be taught uh, sort mm -hmm. of in conjunction with the clinical sciences. And that's not the way it's been done right now. First, you do your basic sciences and then you go on to your clinical sciences. So it's as if those things are just not connected because you spend all that time in the classroom and then you then go to clinical. So I like the way you explained this article. Um, it, it, you explained this concept from the perspective of music. So can you tell us some more about this um, article? Okay, thanks. So um, in, um, in all fairness, I have to say that um, medical education has made some progress. Um, so the, um, we are starting to see more and more integration of the clinical sciences with the basic sciences and the medical students are being exposed to patients in the clinical sciences much earlier than they used to be, but I still think that we have a long way to go overall. But what the idea I was exploring in the essay was, was that, um, for example, when you learn, you learn anatomy and you learn uh, biochemistry and physiology, you know, and then you don't see patients and you, you know, and then what you're learning in the classroom is not related to, it's, it's not, it, it's not immediately relevant. And when you don't um, see patients while you're learning about, um, while you're learning those the basic sciences yes and so for example for example um at uh, the medical school where i used to be on faculty when the students were learning um about the pelvic anatomy um they also learned how to insert a speculum into a female patient and you know and to me that made so much sense it made so much sense that while you're learning the anatomy of that uh, that part of the body you're also learning um, how to approach a patient who has a problem in that area or who you have to examine, you know, who's the, when you have to do an exam on that part of the body. I, I thought it just made so, um, so much sense. Right. You know, when I learned, when I first learned neuroanatomy uh, uh, many, many, many years ago, I did not enjoy it at all. I didn't enjoy it. It was like, you know, a lot of memorizations, you know, of pathways and tracks and all of that, you know, and it was just so boring and it seemed so hard. Now, when I now went back to school and went to the medical school at Penn State Hershey, um, the curriculum was was a lot more integrated <laughs> there. So I learned when we were learning neuroanatomy, we were also learning about patients. So we weren't necessarily seeing patients act. I mean, we had some patient interactions, not a whole lot, but we learned about you know what happens you know so if a patient has a stroke this is a part of the brain that's affected and this is how it manifests so it made much more sense to be learning about the physical structures while we're also learning about patients and what would happen or what we would expect to see when something went wrong you know the pathophysiology and that made a lot of sense now why am i saying all of that how does that relate to to music so again, I didn't have formal music instruction um, as a kid. I had just a few, um, less than a year of piano lessons as a child, actually. So I learned, I, I, I did not really learn music in a system, systematic way. But even if I had, I, um, my understanding of music now is so much, it's, it's so much more comprehensive because I've, I've, um, I've educated myself, you know, I've taken more lessons as an adult, but I've also done a lot of reading. So when I learned, to play the piano, I learned to read music, all right? To read the, you know, the notes, so, you know, every good boy deserves fudge. Um, I didn't learn anything about music theory. I didn't learn, and um, again, I only had lessons very briefly, but I, even if I had continued, I don't think that I would have been taught music theory, um, in, at least not in any comprehensive way. So I was learning about how to read individual notes and you know, and, uh, and that's how I played, you know, playing individual notes, struggling to read and playing individual notes. It was years later when I um, learned to play the guitar and I realized I could just play a few chords and accompany, you know, a lot of songs just by playing a few chords. I realized that, wait a minute, you can do this on the piano too. I could just play chords on the piano and not have to struggle to read music. And, and I realized that that's what people do. People, when we say people are playing by ear, they're actually, playing chords, you know, so they understand enough music theory that they understand chord progressions and they know how to play without sheet music, you know, um, and, and, and that's something that I hadn't understood 
um, as a child, you know, I used to, you know, marvel at how people could just sit on the piano, just hear something, just start playing. I thought they just had some, you know, magical ability or some, not really magical, but some innate ability to just know what to play. And I, you know, not understanding that there was an actual system and, and their actual chords. So um, I went for a music retreat in 2013. And then we were learning, um, we, were, we had some lessons on music theory. And one of our assignments was to look at um, a, music, a, a sheet of music and to identify the chords. So I was working with a friend and we, were, we got to this one section of the music and we were really confused. We were like, well, we think it's, I can't remember what chord it was, but it seemed like it was missing a note. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and this, um, this might not make sense to people who don't understand uh, um, sheet music, but basically the note that we thought was missing was, um, was in the bass clef and we were just looking at the treble clef. So the way, the way the music was written, I knew playing that if I was playing, I had to play all the notes at the same time other notes that were in the same position, whether they were in the bass clef or the treble clef. But when I was trying to analyze the music, I didn't have the, it seems so obvious now. <laughs> it just didn't occur to me mm -hmm. that, you know, that the, the missing note might just be below, <laughs> right. below in, the, in the bass clef. And when we finally figured it out because our teacher told us, it seems so obvious, but why, why were we thinking like that again because I didn't learn to think in chords right you know what I did yes. I, didn't, I didn't learn to think in chords if I had learned to think about chords and chord patterns it would have made perfect sense that you know whether the note is in the bass clef or the treble clef if you're playing them at the same time what you're really doing is playing chords you know and so again it's like when you don't teach things in a comprehensive fashion people don't learn the students don't learn they don't learn in a, um, in a holistic fashion and it, and it really it, um, it manifests itself in things like that. Now, when it comes to music, well, you know, nobody's, no, nobody's gonna get hurt if I play the wrong notes, right? I, I might be embarrassed, but, right. but, but I'm not gonna hurt anybody. But with medicine, you're dealing with people's lives. So it really does matter that we train our, uh, our students to think holistically and to, um, yeah, and to just have a better understanding of the integration of, uh, of the science of the basic and the clinical sciences because it does matter for patient care <laughs> yeah yeah in, in your article so uh in your article you mentioned that this is really important because uh so let me just uh, make a comment about how you have a very broad perspective in terms of medical training because you trained as a dentist in nigeria yeah. And then yes. you moved to the United States where you trained as a medical doctor. So you are like, I don't know, superwoman or something because Thank after you. dental school, you then came to, as a fully fledged dentist, you now came to the States and you started all over again. So- And I actually have mm -hmm. a public health degree in between. <laughs> yes, it's, it's incredible. So, and then I like where, you said here, uh, music and medicine have been described as having a symbiotic relationship that improves listening and communication skills. So this is so important because right now, the struggle, especially in developing countries, resource limited countries is the ability to communicate effectively with patients. And mm -hmm. here you say it very nicely. You said even listening skills can be developed, um, mm -hmm. you know, while playing music. And you also mentioned that the musically trained ear is more likely mm -hmm. to hear those subtle cardiac mm -hmm. murmurs. And so, the, you know, I, so like for me, I, I didn't have the opportunity to formally learn how to play a musical instrument. I really wanted to, but I did not mm -hmm. have that opportunity. Growing up in a middle-class uh, home in Nigeria, the, the, that opportunity was just not there. That opportunity, even though I wanted to, that opportunity mm -hmm. was just not there. And sometimes mm -hmm. I feel a little bit disadvantaged when I see people who are able to play music, because I think learning to 
play a musical instrument gives you some kind of advantage, some kind of competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, and what, what you say is so interesting because you said you played music for just one year, but then that one year of playing music seemed to have for you quite a uh, significant impact because as an adult, you're now doing it so well because I've heard you play music and you play the piano so beautifully. So tell me, how Thank old you. were you when you started playing? When How old were you when you started taking lessons in music? So, yeah, so actually, yeah, I, I had formal lessons for less than a year. In, in fifth grade, I was nine and I, I finally got lessons and then I changed schools and didn't have lessons anymore. So yes, I learned the fundamentals, but there's not really a whole lot you can learn in that short a time. I, for me, I think the fact that I, um, that I just, I had this, I, I guess it was a passion inside me. I never lost interest and my parents would encourage me to play practice when I was home on holidays, but, but I wasn't, I wasn't getting taught. I wasn't getting, you know what I mean? I didn't have guidance. I was just playing on my own. Uh, so I, I think a part of it was just that, um, that underlying interest that just never went away. And then I just, I don't know, I guess I, I'm the kind of person that tends to be very, very persistent when I really want to do something or when I really like something. Um, um, and then over the years, you know, when I would get the chance, I would practice, I would play. If I went to somebody's house and there was a piano, there, I would go to the piano and play. And, um, and um, I just, yeah, so I just kept, kept it up on my own. And like, and like I said, it was only till recently that I, um, started uh, I took lessons again uh, and just tried to see if I could um, you know improve you know get some formal formal instruction and uh, yeah and it's it's been very it's been very helpful I finally found a teacher um, in Scranton where I used to live up till last year who not only was very good with the uh, oh, he is very good not just with the uh, with uh, reading with sheet music, but he's also very good with playing by ear and improvising and he plays multiple instruments. And, and that was my ideal teacher because uh, that, that's the kind of person I needed. Most, in my experience, most teachers are either good at reading music or, um, or you know, chords and improvisation and that sort of thing. You know, it's not very common to find somebody who could do both very well. Yes. Um, and that's what I was able, yeah. And so, and I was fortunate to find that. But again, it's for me. I think it was really persistence and just knowing that this was something I really wanted to do. And I, I felt bad that I didn't get piano lessons earlier. I felt bad that I had to change schools right after getting piano lessons, and then I didn't have anyone to teach me in my next school. I didn't even have a teacher. Um, but again, it's you know, I was always a daddy's girl, and daddy wanted me to play the piano, and I, and I, you know. I knew it would make him proud. My mom encouraged me to. So, I, you know, it was yeah. a sort of thing where, where you want your parents to be proud of you. Yes, they want you to be a doctor, but they also want to be able to say, oh, she's a doctor and she plays the piano and she does yeah. this, that. And, you, know, you know how Nigerian parents are. I don't need to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, this is, I, I mean, hopefully someone listening to this will encourage their kids to uh, learn how to play music at a younger age because I think some yeah. of these lessons you learn as a kid you, it's easy for you to kind of fall into uh, mm -hmm. into them as you get older you know if you were not exposed yeah. as a child to music mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a little more difficult as an adult to say oh I, yeah. like for me now oh I want to go play the piano in my 50s that is really kind of a bit of a challenge <laughs> Um, yeah. I always wanted to play the drums. I wanted to play the drums, and I still have this thing where I still want to play the drums. So, it's never, um, too late. It's <laughs> never too late. Yeah. So, I, 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 anytime if I go anywhere and I see people playing the drums, I'm always like, oh, can I, <laughs> can I play the drums? So, yeah. it's something that never left me. I really, it was just something I wanted to do as a kid, you know? but then. Uh, the school I the, the primary school I attended did not allow girls to play the drums and oh, you so see, that was how bad. I missed out on that but uh, that was that, that is something yeah. I'll I'll be this uh 80 year old woman playing the drums one day. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, drum now I mean I, I I don't think it's fair to I, I think that's um stereotyping saying that girls shouldn't play drums uh, certain instruments are for 
you know, boys and certain instruments are for girls. Yeah. I think we should just encourage, we should encourage each, Boy. each child to be, to be themselves. You we're, know, we're talking I mean, about the seventies now. <laughs> I know, I know. We're talking I know. about I mean, the, the olden days. Things have changed now and girls and, and boys and I everyone know. can play I, the drums, but we're talking about the seventies. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, sure. And I, I'm guilty too, because I remember meeting a guy, this was an American who played the flute. And I thought, wow, the flute, that's a pretty feminine instrument, you know, <laughs> you know because I, I think of the flute as a very feminine instrument, but what's wrong with the guy playing a flute? I mean, why do we attach gender to instruments anyway? <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway. I don't, I don't, uh, I personally don't think the flute is feminine because I've seen a lot of men play the flute. So I thought the flute was masculine. So that is interesting. Oh, really? We all have different, what? yeah, we all have different perceptions of what oh. the musical instrument is. But I know as a, as a child, maybe seven, eight, uh, in the school I attended, it would playing the drums was actually for the boys and the girls thing. Oh yeah, well that, I mean, I understand, I understand them thinking that the drums were for boys, but, but I, I don't agree with it. But I do want to go back to what you uh, mentioned earlier about the whole idea of um, listening skills being um, developed by, um, you know, with musical training. And I think that that's so true. I mean, I don't feel like I got it because I didn't really have formal musical training as such. Mm -hmm. But now that I know what I know, I just, I, I feel like I need to be a strong advocate for musical training because, and not just for musical training, but, um, the humanity, the arts and the humanities overall, I think really, really do need to play a strong role in medical education. So they're on, on so many different levels. So, so like you said, you know, uh, people who have musical training, you're, you're trained to use your ears, you know, and then, and, and that, that, that ability can make an, make a difference in terms of how you care for your patients. You, you might be the one to pick up that murmur that nobody else, heard, you know, you know, when you deal with rhythm as well, you know, um, again, getting used to what is a normal rhythm and then you're listening to heart sounds, you know, and is this, um, is, is, does this patient have an arrhythmia, arrhythmia you know, things yeah. like that, things like that, yeah. that we wouldn't, we wouldn't typically think of, you know, so I, I want people to get away from thinking that music um, is just a hobby, that all these things are just hobbies. No, they can make you, these hobbies, these so-called hobbies can actually make you a better clinician, a better Absolutely. doctor, you know. Absolutely, Listen. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Listen. I think, I yeah. think what it does is it gives you, um, it gives you, um, let's say, What's the word I'm looking? Makes you well-rounded. That's what I'm looking well, definitely, for. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And I had a friend. I had a friend at uh, Penn State Hershey who who said she got into medical school because she played the violin. I mean, I guess she was joking, but she did mm -hmm. make a point of saying that you know the fact that she played a violin. I don't know if it was something that came up in the interview or whatever, mm -hmm. but she apparently felt it, it made a difference or had an impact in their, you know, in their decision to accept her. And Penn State uh, College of Medicine is a school that really places a, a lot of emphasis on the humanities and they really, you know, and in general, I think more and more uh, medical schools are realizing that they want to have uh, people who are well-rounded mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and that the arts and the humanities do make us more, uh, you know, they make they help us to be more well-rounded you know yes. uh, more empathetic more empathetic yes. you know better listeners um there's even an article uh that i read recently um uh medical school should admit more guitar players <laughs> that really? was what they <laughs> that's what they that's what they called uh, yeah well, that's what they titled the article you know and um and the discussion was around you know the humanities and uh, medical education and uh, but but then again, is it a chicken or or an egg sort of thing? Is it that people who who have those artistic interests already are you know more inclined to um, to go to medical school and to be a certain kind of doctor, or is it that that learning the humanities in medical school makes them better doctors? You know, I so there's a lot of research that needs to be done. There's a lot of um, we still have so much to learn, but we we do know that in general, you know. Uh, the arts and the humanities make us more well-rounded. And again, we need to, to I, again, beyond medicine, I think that in general, we need to teach the arts and the sciences in an integrated fashion. You know, I don't believe in this left brain, right brain dichotomy. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I keep thinking about writing an essay 
with a title that's something that has something like that goes something like um, the corpus callosum exists for a reason. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, the corpus callosum for our listeners who might not um, might, might not uh, know what that is. That's the that's what joins your left brain and your right brain. Simply put, yeah. So there's a reason why we have why there's something that connects the left and the right brain because they're supposed to work together, not yes. independently. Not independently. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. It's like the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing type of thing. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, exactly. You know, and I, I, I feel that again, in educational systems where kids are, or students are forced to choose the sciences or the arts at a very young age, I feel like mm -hmm. that's not really fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, students should have a broad based education, you know, mm -hmm. you shouldn't, for, how, how do you want to kid that's still in high school to know what they want to do for the rest of their lives I mean mm -hmm. you know people change their minds all the time and yeah. people you know adults change their minds and adults change professions mm -hmm. you know I um so I, I I don't think that that's that that it's fair and then when you've forced a kid to choose you know the arts or the sciences and that they're kind of stuck they're, they're limited in what they can do mm -hmm. because you know because they were forced to make a decision uh, prematurely but if you expose them to the sciences and the arts and allow them to continue exploring, then that gives them more options, you know, and um, yeah, it gives them more options. And I just, again, I think that um, our educational system is, is in need for re reform, uh, is in need of reform. And I think yeah. that it's not just, it's not just medical education, it's, it's the whole spectrum. And I'm very passionate about that because I really do, um, yeah, I really do feel strongly about early education and how we raise our children and how we um, how we train them. You know, um, we should train them to be problem solvers. You know, we should train and and how do you do that? You have to encourage creativity. Yes. You know, and and encouraging creativity includes encouraging them to express themselves. You know, if if they have artistic um, ability or talent, you know encourage them to develop that but then how does a child even know that they have that if they're not exposed if they're not in the right environment if they don't have anybody to help them you know to help help them see empower what they them. have mm -hmm. exactly anybody to empower them yeah mm -hmm. tap into the talent or direct the talent exactly. or funnel the talent you know that's exactly cool. you know um Okay, well, um, I really enjoyed this conversation I've I've learned a lot from it. And um, I think okay. that the listeners will find a lot of value in listening to the link between creativity, music, and medicine. I think it's just absolutely essential yeah, uh, in this yeah. day and age that we, we find mm -hmm. ourselves in. Communication mm -hmm. is absolutely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, it leads to better care. Uh, mm -hmm. It leads to better understanding. It leads to better outcomes. It leads to better outcomes, and um, I think that's the way forward. So yeah. I, I I agree. Some music should be introduced. I think even schools, primary schools that don't have music on offer. I think the best thing is to catch them young. Yes, and yes. and offer at least um, children in their formative years access mm -hmm. to uh, learning music. Oh yes, yes, I I feel very strongly, very very strongly about that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I have I have a very good friend who's a missionary in Nigeria. Who mm -hmm. um, she's a musician, and she she went to Nigeria with her husband, not not planning to start a music school. He was mm -hmm. going to um, work as part of a hospital revitalization project and then um and she started a music school and it's just so amazing to see what's what they've done so i've been uh involved in helping to support that process and i i just feel so passionate about it i think it's so important i wish we could have music schools all over all over nature yes i second over. that i do i second yeah. that this is great yeah. this has really been a wonderful discussion i've learned so much so um, you have a book on Amazon, and um, I'd like to give it a shout out. Thank you. And, uh, so it's the, yeah, the amazing world of butterflies, my photo book. Yes. So we'll put the 
link. We'll put the Amazon link in the comments, right? In the comments yes. section. Thank you yes. so much. I, I will do that. I will do that. Thank you so much, Pedro, for your time. I really appreciate you spending this uh, evening talking to me. And uh, we we'll look forward to more uh, wonderful discussions. Sure. My pleasure, Ngozi. Thank you so much. All right. So...